difference it yields compared to other uh, types of um, methods of assessing facility performance or FM performance, okay? The concept of usability is described as the ability of a building facility to support user organizations, economic and professional objectives. So that means that in fact, what it tries to do is to assess the extent to which a facility supports the user organizations, economic and professional objectives. As you well know, FM performance evaluation in um, this field focuses usually on the link between the facility or its management and the achievement of corporate goals and objectives. But we also acknowledge the fact that facility management has gone beyond just a focus on the workplace. Facility management now encompasses far more than the workplace. FM has to do with residential facilities, has to do with public facilities. And so we must understand that um, when we talk about user object, I mean, um, fulfillment of, of uh, corporate objectives, the scope has widened to include user objectives. And in the aspect of usability assessment in particular, a lot of focus is placed on the user, a lot of uh, attention is placed on the extent to which the facility meets user requirements, user expectations, user objectives. So um, let's define it and uh, use that. Maybe you can compare this definition with the other definition you have. Hello, can you hear me still? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank yes, you. Oh, lovely. We can compare the definition with what we had and see whether we can use one to enrich the other, okay? It is described as the effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction with which a specified set of users can achieve a specified set of tasks in a particular environment. I take that again. The effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction with which, sorry, my mic is playing again. Okay, it is the effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction with which a specified set of users can achieve a specified set of tasks in a particular environment. That definition is as given by the International Organization for Standardization, ISO 9241 and it was given as far back as 1998. Please take note of that, International Organization for Standardization. And uh, the definition is given under ISO 9241-11. And it was given as far back as 1998. Now, one peculiar thing about that uh, concept is that usability can be put in a nutshell as a technique that assesses fitness for purpose fitness for purpose, how fit is that facility for purpose? And whose purpose? It has to be in relation to a particular purpose. So if I want to assess the usability of a classroom, uh, I will be looking at it from the perspective of what is an ideal classroom supposed to achieve? What 
kind of services should an ideal classroom provide? What, to what extent is that facility conducive, useful, and appropriate for use as a classroom? So in the same way, we're saying that when we apply the usability code, we're looking at the ethical field for which it is designed and for which it is being used. Okay, now when you break down the key elements, effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction, we will find that certain keywords appear. Those keywords include functionality, serviceability, okay and we must understand that usability is a wider concept than functionality in other words functionality is just an element one of the key criteria with which we judge usability while functionality examines performance of design objectives generally without considering particular users and contexts this concept of usability considers all those it looks at the performance of design objectives from the perspective of particular users and within particular contexts another word you can use which is similar in application is serviceability. Serviceability considers the context and the variety of tasks, although it doesn't consider the peculiar users. So three terms have been brought up for your notice here. Usability, functionality, and serviceability. If you were asked to differentiate between the three, you should understand that usability encompasses both functionality and serviceability. That functionality is the most limited of the three concepts because it looks at performance of design objectives generally without considering particular users and contexts. On the other hand, serviceability considers the context and variety of tasks, but does not consider users, the particular peculiar users. Whereas usability considers all three, the context, the particular users, as well as the design objectives. So that is very important for you to note. Now let us, how did this idea of usability arise in the first place? Who designed it and how and why? Okay, the context, I mean, the idea of usability <clears throat> is based on the pragmatist philosophy of Pierce, who propounded the idea as far back as 1905. And his view was that what works well is what is worth achieving. And also that the work of uh, Dewey in 1977, you know, both of them uh, were able to identify nine variables, nine key issues that we need to focus on when we are talking about usability. Before I come to that, I would like to talk to you about the framework which was also designed, the framework for assessing usability, designed in a Norwegian workshop, you know, on the idea of usability. And that took place in 2004. And they looked at the workshop uh, as a means of articulating how usability should be conceptualized and uh, operationalized in any um, assessment that it is meant to carry out. So what are those nine variables that the original designers of usability considered? 
that is in nine variables that Pierce brought out in 1905, which was refined by Dewey in 1977. Yeah, they include the following. Number one, the criterion of user focus. User focus. That is focus is on the user and the organization that uh, makes use of the facility, not so much the facility. In other facility performance evaluation methods, usually place emphasis on the facility or the building. But in this instance, the focus, the primary focus is on the user, his experience as regards how efficient or effective or satisfactory defines that facility for the purpose eh, in respect to which he either procured or is using the facility. The second criteria, the second factor to take note of out of the nine is that the assessment of usability must be based on demand. The dem it is demand driven. It derives from the strategic objectives and the dynamic requirements of the organization or the user. So it is the dynamic objectives, the strategic objectives of the user and the dynamic nature of those objectives that derives what we will be looking for under usability. The third point is that it focuses on user experience. Okay, we have already said user focus. And uh, what are we looking for under user focus? We are looking for the user's experience, okay? The, the user's perception is the one that overrides other factors that we might normally want to look at. Normally, we might like to look at the design of the facility, uh, what the designers had in mind when they were you know, doing the architectural design. But at the end of the day, what the designer had in mind may not match what the user really needed. So those of us who are architects should always bear this in mind. Sometimes we have an idea and we just want to produce this aesthetic uh, contraption, this aesthetic structure that boosts our ego, that makes us feel that, oh, we have done something unique and extraordinary. The design is admirable, it's state of the art, it uses all the uh, new technologies and all that. But the big question that you must always ask yourself is, does it fit the purpose of the user? How well does it fit that purpose? And that is why user experience is so crucial in assessing usability. Another thing that we uh, need to look at based on the idea of PES 1905 is the context of use. The context of use. That means we assess the facility in the context of the use of those users at that particular point in time. If you have a facility that is adaptable for various uses, but at that particular point in time, it is being used as residential facility, maybe for uh, uh, students, let's just put it in that context. If it is being used as a residential facility for students, we will be looking at the experience of the students who are using it at that point in time. Let us say during the holidays, the same facility becomes for use for lodgers, like a kind of a adapted hotel. People are coming in for short stay from the UK, from Canada, from wherever, and they only need to stay somewhere for a month or for a week or two weeks. Now, we would, if we are going to assess usability again, we will not be using the student's perception or the student's experience we will now be assessing usability from the perspective of these uh, transient visitors who are only there for a short time 
and who have come from abroad and are staying locally just for the, maybe a holiday or a conference or things like that. I hope I'm making myself clear. So the context of use is very crucial because that is what determines what the user will be experiencing. That is what determines what the user will be expecting. Then another factor, which is the fifth one now, is the process orientation, process orientation, okay? We are considering the process rather than the product. The process is the emphasis, not so much the product at the end of the day. Then yet again, is the issue of contingency quality. Okay, that's the sixth item now, contingency quality. Okay, we are emphasizing under that user values. User values, okay, that are uh, what they are calling critical in the context of the assessment, user values, okay? What do I place emphasis on? Is it comfort? Is it a, a, a usability, uh, what do I call it now, functionality? Is it uh, adaptability? What, if, if I'm a user of a facility, it is that aspect that's most important to me that will drive my perception of its usability. So let us say, for instance, we have a, 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 a facility, it's a ground floor that is open plan and that has glass panels open to the streets. Uh, that suggests immediately that those glass panels, which permit passers-by to look into the ground floor, could be useful for display of goods and services. If I'm into fashion design, I'm going to put mannequins with the various uh, you know, dresses I have made and all that on the ground floor so that passers-by can see what I have to offer and come calling. So if you ask me at that point in time where my uh, 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 assessment of usability of that space would lay emphasis, I would say you know, it's amenability for use for the purpose of displaying my wares. Meanwhile, that same facility could be useful to another organization that is not necessarily into retailing or uh, uh, fashion designing. It could be useful to an organization that offers library services and the glass panels there might be showing you know, the kind of materials I have available in the library. A uh, library de de deserves quietness, a library deserves, you know, so the, the expectations of the user for the place as a library would definitely differ from the expectations of the user of the same space as a design, uh, sorry, a fashion designing center. So all we are trying to say still lays emphasis on this aspect of the user and his expectation and experience as being the factor that most determines usability, fitness for purpose, capacity of the facility to meet user requirements at any point in time. Okay, then the next factor, you know, I mentioned that there were nine uh, criteria used by those who originally designed usability as a concept for measuring performance. They looked at number seven as service production. And this considers the facility to be a product of a combination of service users. That means facilities are co-created by service users. You have different users. For instance, talk about the retailer, Person. The retailer is using the place for retail. There are customers coming in to buy things. There are people coming in to deliver goods. There are probably government inspectors coming in to evaluate. So different classes of users will relate to the facility in different ways, depending on what their emphasis is. Then another uh, aspect, the number eight one, is relationship management. This one implies that there are 
changing relationships with users because nothing is ever static. User might you know, uh, need to relate with the facility in a way different from another user. And then we must understand that even under the concept of usability, everything is still a learning process. There'll be exchange of knowledge among users. There'll be exchange of experiences in. And one person's um, uh, uh, articulation of their experience might affect how others will also begin to perceive the same facility. So all these nine criteria that they brought up you know, are bound up in uh, three major criteria used under the framework. That framework is very interesting and I want you to understand it very well because keywords are brought up, but those keywords subsume some other uh, concepts which are used in assessing um, uh, um, usability. I'm no, sorry one. to this, what was the ninth one, yes. please? What's the ninth one? The ninth one, the ninth one, as I mentioned to you, is the learning process. Learning, you know, I said, in all things, you, you, you end up exchanging knowledge, exchanging experiences. What does that mean? You know, remember I said a little while ago that you might have a facility that has different types of users and your experience as a user might be changed, might be affected. What you start expecting, what you start experiencing might be modified by your uh, uh, coming into the knowledge of what others share as their experiences with the same facility. Okay, let me illustrate that to make it clearer. Here we are, we are a class of about 40 something or 50 something students. The way you relate to the classroom we used to use when we were having physical lectures might not always be the same as the way everybody else in the class relates to it might not be the same way the lecturer relates to it. While some students might feel comfortable and say, oh, this is okay, uh, there's AC, there's lighting, we can plug our phones, we can plug our laptops and still take our lecture. We have an uh, overhead projector, it makes our lecture easy to relate with. Some other student who is coming from a far advanced environment might not find it conducive. He might complain, that uh, the, the sound, uh, the, the acoustics is not good enough or the temperature is not good enough. You understand what I mean? So different users in the same facility having similar objectives, but they might have different experiences and they might have different perspectives. So all these people that designed the framework were trying to tell us is that the subsumed in the process of usability is a learning process. Each user might be influenced by what he hears from the other facility users. And so we need not be too uh, fixed in our expectation. We must understand that what is expressed might be modifications based on learning of other people's experiences. Are you clear right now? Hello, are you clear now? May I proceed? Yes, ma, thank you. Yes, ma. Thank proceed. you very much. Okay. So those were the nine key elements that the originators of the usability concept was about. Now we are trying to look at the framework, how to assess usability. And I said it is very interesting because the framework enunciates three major criteria, but under the three, there are certain sub-criteria that are used. You must not forget the uh, overall, the overarching focus of the usability concept, okay? That it is user-specific and it is also based on the uh, uh, um, expectation of the user in relation to the purpose of which is using the facility. 
okay? So the um, ISO uh, standard for uh, ergonomics as referred to in a paper, which I will refer you to at the end of this discussion to go and read, uh, uh, mentioned disability uh, as something that you know, embodies three critical elements, which include efficiency, effectiveness, and satisfaction, key elements. Now, we must uh, look at this in relation to the, uh, 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 the users, but also we must not forget that the users are evaluating the facility and how it fits their purpose. So the criteria you'll find listed under each of these major headings uh, relates to the user in relation to the facility. I hope you understand that. So the, the, the framework is as follows. Under efficiency, under efficiency, we will be looking at the things like costs, quality, and intensity of use. The cost, the quality, and the intensity of use. Okay, in relation to the organization or the user, they will be interested to, uh, you know, uh, find out how the use of that facility affects production time and costs per unit. Production time and costs. Maybe the facilities are, uh, are wired. This is easy for faster productivity and lower costs. Okay, maybe some uh, require longer uh, operational time as higher cost. Maybe some require fewer staff and uh, you know more equipment or the other way around. These things relate to the organization, the user organization and how its work has to be organized in relation to the space, in relation to the facility. Also, it looks at the uh, uh, the timeline, the time aspect, because of you know possibilities of interruptions during production. Does that happen? If that happens, why does it happen? And is this something intrinsic with the facility that needs to be corrected? Is it a deficiency or is it just the way the facility is designed? So in a nutshell, on the efficiency, we're looking at cost, quality of output, operational costs, and intensity of use. All these three should not threaten efficiency of the organization, should not threaten their financial viability. Very important. So under the criterion of efficiency, usability tries to evaluate the costs, that the user has to bear using that facility, looks at the quality of the user's output, looks at what are the operational exigencies that have to be borne, and then also looks at the intensity with which the facility can be used, okay? And, you know, if, if a, a facility is to be usable at an optimal level, the cost, the quality of output and the intensity of use must be such that they do not threaten the organization's financial viability. Then the second aspect has to do with efficiency. Now, under efficiency, sorry, under uh, effectiveness, okay? But we still come back to relate what we're saying to the building. I want you to understand very well how we are going about this. As far as effectiveness is concerned, some things are very crucial. 
and this includes the extent to which the, the use of that facility adds value to existing products. How well does it add value to existing products? Added value in terms of what? In terms of potential for innovation. In terms of cooperation among those that do the work. In terms of communication among those that do the work, that, that use the facility to carry out the work. Also, it has the element of adaptability because if the facility is to effectively uh, contribute value to the use, it must be flexible enough to be adapted to suit that use when the need arises. Okay, so there are some critical elements there and we need to understand that very well. The third one has to do with satisfaction. Now, what are those things that come under satisfaction. Generally speaking, the users will be looking at health elements, health, safety, comfort, and also happiness of the users. Are they happy working under the conditions that the facility puts them under? Are they happy with temperature, with lighting? The, is, it, is it okay for their health or is this a health hazard? And uh, how much comfort does it afford while they are doing the work? Okay, under the framework, okay, this includes things like uh, the kind of things that customers will look out for, the kind of things that employees will also look out for, air quality. Okay, how clean is the air within the facility? Is it comfortable for people to work there without perceiving any unpleasant odors? Uh, is there anything in the air that might cause irritation of the eyes or of the nostrils or of the chest cavity leading to coughs or any kind of health hazards? What about the temperature? What about the aesthetics? Are the colors beautiful? Are they inviting? Do they make for image, good image and identity? Are they pleased with what they find there? Now, to go back and create a fuller picture of that framework, let us take it this way, okay? Remember, under efficiency, we said, you know, we looked at the aspects that are related to the organization. In actual fact, we can assess efficiency in that manner, but in relation to the building, in relation to the facility. In other words, efficiency can be measured in relation to the organization and its expectations and in relation to the facility, the building. So under efficiency, you can have two elements. First, those related to the organization. Secondly, those related to the building. And then in relation to the organization, we say production time and cost per unit, like we said before, development time, cost and units, and then the time element, okay? And what uh, they're able to achieve within given time. In relation to the building, how much of the space is available for use is crucial. Operational area, and that operational area at what cost, okay? So the, the cost per unit area of operational space is important. Another aspect that is important is the number of users that can be accommodated for that space, okay? And then the hours of use and how this translates into costs. So if it is rented space, I think it's easier to understand if it is rented space because you are paying per square meter and the number of hours you can use there might be, let's say from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., 12 hours. 
In other facilities, it might be possible by virtue of location to use it up to 10 p.m. But you might have a location that is uh, challenged by the evidence of miscreants and the activities forcing you to close while it is still daylight. This has effect on your cost per unit area, has effect on your cost of products at the end of the day, because you can only spend limited hours and you can only produce limited number of products within those hours. Now let's just move on to the aspect of effectiveness. Somebody was trying to speak. Okay, nobody. So uh, on the aspect of effectiveness, we talked about adding value and we said there must be potential for innovation, productivity, flexibility. There must be possibility of cooperation among the staff. Also the issue of giving them distinctive uh, image, distinctive opportunity to uh, flexibly, is flexibly use the space or adapt it if need arises. Now we come to the aspect of satisfaction. That framework demands that you look at it from the perspective of the primary users who are your employees, who are your staff, those who are within the facility all the time, those who carry out the work inside the facility. And then the second class of users are the customers those who come in and go out, those who come to transact business there. You might even want to add other users who may be visitors, or maybe inquirers, or those who come to deliver goods, like I mentioned before. But the most common uh, are persons who will be using the facility and from whose perspective, a usability assessment will be useful uh, the employees of the organization and the customers of the organization. So what are the employees looking for? Good air quality, you know, I mentioned that before. They'll be looking out for conducive environment that enables them to work comfortably. They'll be looking for good temperature, good air quality. They'll be looking for aesthetics. They'll be looking for a pleasant working environment uh, that gives them opportunity for functional performance. They'll be looking for consistency in electricity supply, water availability, uh, cooling devices. All those things would be uh, things they expect to make their work easier to do. And then the customers who come in and go uh, this will be looking out for accessibility. They'll be looking for, uh, the, you know, service quality. When they enter, if it's on several floors, are the lifts working? Are the elevators in good condition? Do, are they comfortable to make use of? When you're on the elevator, does it make noise? Does it jerk? Does it stop midway? All those things might, you know, not add value to user experience. So these are things that are contained in the framework that enable us to evaluate how usable a facility is from that technical perspective. Okay, so the, the facility or the building must be able to support user expectations and user experience in a very positive way along these three dimensional criteria. And under each one, we have mentioned what is expected. Okay, now how is it carried out? It's one thing to have a perspective, I mean, a framework. It's another thing to make that framework, uh, 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 I mean, to make use of that framework to achieve your purpose. So how do we assess usability in terms of operationalization? What do we do? What is the method that we apply? Um, as we said, when we were treating post-occupancy evaluation, we said you can uh, do um, a walkthrough, walk through the facility. And as you are walking through with a group of the users, some selected from the various categories of users, you can 
point out key areas and ask questions as regards what their experience is. How do they identify with that aspect of the facility? How much of their work does it contribute value to? How adaptable do they find it? You can create you know, a, a, a guide whereby as you are doing the work day, you are throwing questions that enable you to assess those key elements of the facility along those major criteria of efficiency, effectiveness, and satisfaction. So workflow is one thing. Another method you can use is a workshop. You can select a number of the uh, various categories of users, sit them together in a workshop, and discuss with them at length you know, present your, uh, your uh, uh, um, purpose for the assessment, let them give you feedback with regards to the, the experience within the facility. Most organized, I mean, most efforts to do a disability assessment would use several of these uh, approaches, all with the purpose of getting a rounded uh, feedback, a rounded evaluation that gives uh, opportunity for a thorough report and necessary adaptation at the end of the day. Okay, so we have mentioned one, walk through, two, workshop, three, you can do a questionnaire, questionnaire as part of your assessment. So you do a survey using a questionnaire and you encourage those various classes of users to fill the questionnaire. Of course, the questionnaire will be very carefully designed to include all the elements of efficiency, effectiveness, and satisfaction containing all those key elements that we mentioned. Yet another approach is to interview, interview the various categories of users. Now, I want you to take note of something which is very, very important. And that is that uh, in carrying out a study like this, it is also useful to refer to the design documents. To refer, just like when we talked about post occupancy evaluation, we said a good starting point would be to discuss with the architects, discuss with those who procured the building with a view to understanding uh, the brief they were given to start with and how they interpreted that brief into the structure that is standing. Even in the same way, where you are carrying out a usability assessment, you can start also from an assessment of the documents, the architectural design, uh, the, the, the drawings as built, the brief and all the key elements that were emphasized in it. Okay, so all these key things that we mentioned, you can look at and then now this, this, uh, decide which of the approaches would best suit your purpose of finding out how the disability assessment would best be carried out. Now, as in the case of a questionnaire, you can make use of uh, a Likert scale in trying to encourage the users to, to rate the facility. Remember, we're talking about satisfaction. That's one you cannot get unless you let them rate the facility, maybe on a five point scale, like that scale, or a four, a, a four point or seven point scale. You are trying to decide uh, how uh, um, well they rate the facility. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you might say something like, uh, um, question, how uh, satisfactory do you find the uh, uh, conveniences in this facility? And number one, might be, number one rating might be excellent. Give that a certain score. Uh, second one might be fairly good. Give that a certain score. Number three might be just fair. Give that a certain score. The next one might be you are undecided, you know, that kind of a thing. And then you go down the scale 
you know, poor, very poor, extremely poor, you know. So you have this Likert scale, and you put scores, you know, seven, uh, you know, uh, six, five, three, and so on down the line. So that when they put their scores, and you aggregate those scores, you'll be able to use the computation of those scores to decide uh, which of the areas are scored highest, that the ones that give the highest satisfaction, which of the areas are scored the lowest, the ones that give the least satisfaction. Now, it doesn't stop there. Scoring or rating is one thing. The insight you really need is to identify what is wrong with those areas that they are not satisfied with? What is uh, the defect in those areas that they are not happy with? So that you will know what to correct. What's the essence of a facility performance evaluation if we cannot identify the areas that need to be corrected? So it's, it's a very simple framework and it is easy to implement. It's just that you must be careful not to miss out key details that might give you the necessary feedback that you need, okay? So you can do walkthrough while you are doing the walkthrough uh, is to make sure that no aspect of the building facility is left out of the assessment. As you come in through the entrance door, you ask questions pertaining to the reception area, you go from there maybe to the lifts. The lifts are means of conveyance to upper floors, maybe the stairs also, the conveniences, and the workspaces, the, the uh, uh, detached offices, and the other ones that are the open offices, the, the, the areas where they interact, kitchenettes, everything. You, you Walking through helps you not to forget any elements, maybe the sockets, things that you might ordinarily overlook if all you did was the paperwork. Now, like I said before, an assessment might make use of all these uh, approaches together because you want to be thorough and you want to have as much detail as possible. On the other hand, depending on the size of the facility, depending on the number of users that you have and their different categories, Depending also on the nature of the facility, you might want to just pick one of these approaches that best satisfies your usability assessment. Now, having said all that, when you have all your data, what next should you do? You should collect the data and use that to judge at the end of the day what your assessment of its performance is. It is interesting to note that usability service of the same facility, the same building, might yield different results for different kinds of uses and for different kinds of users. But that's the full essence of it. You are checking usability for a particular purpose. You are checking usability for a particular set of users. And so, the, the uh, way you use usability assessment uh, will have to do with the requirement of a, of a particular setting, of a particular use, uh, and a particular class of users. So in, in essence, that is all that we, we do when we carry out usability service. And it's a very good tool when your emphasis is on user experience with regards to a particular purpose. Now, what examples can we quote? Uh, in a hospital, a hospital is a good example. We have different categories of users. We have patients. We have long-term patients. We have short-stay patients. We have doctors. We have nurses. We have uh, cleaners. We have, uh, you know, those who work in the pharmacy. We have uh, Porters, those who carry uh, patients from ward to uh, 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 what do you call it now to the uh, operating theater. You know, a big hospital will have so many types of users, and each class of user might have their own specific space dedicated to them 
for their peculiar purpose. For instance, those who are the pharmacists may not be involved in the operating theater. Their, their place of focus will be the store where the drugs are kept, where some of the drugs have to be kept under certain temperatures, and also the storage space where they have to stack different packages and the delivery space where the vehicles are bringing those things, driving and where they carry the items into the store. And then the shelves where they are displayed for ease of access when it is time to dispense. Mm -hmm. Their own identification with their space and their, their assessment of its effectiveness and assessment of its efficiency may not be quite the same as those of the doctors. Doctors have their consultation rooms, but they also go to the wards and they make use of the operating theater. They probably have common rooms where they act and things like that. So uh, you might find that in a hospital, you have so many different types of users and so many different types of spaces designated for their use. And uh, with respect to which we have to carry out disability assessment. But that doesn't stop us overall from coming to a final judgment on the usability of the entire hospital as a hospital facility. So it's an interesting uh, tool and it's something that on your own, without being told, you might even want to practice if you belong to an organization managing any particular class or facility. Now, usability as a tool is developing. It has not yet been perfected. Why do I say that? That's because it seems to be so uh, 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 divided. So I hate to use that word, but I can't find it. Yeah, exactly. right now. The fact that you are, you are looking at usability within specific contexts makes it a little bit uh, not as clear cut as when you have one approach that you can use at all times under different uh, situations. So um, you find that uh, it's evolving. We are perfecting that too. We are perfecting that concept with time. And as time goes on, it can only become better. Okay, so we talked about certain elements which uh, you needed to take note of, functionality, serviceability, uh, usability, and how one subsumes the other. We talked about the need for you to look at things from the perspective of the users and the fact that the users are of different categories, the organization as a whole, then it's staff who may be of different categories, then it's customers, and those even come to make inquiries, okay? Now the quality of user experience is very crucial and that is what this tool aims to get at. And also uh, don't forget what I said about fitness for purpose. When we face the facility, what we're actually trying to assess in that facility is how fit, how suitable is it for the purpose for which it is designed and for which it is um, uh, uh, procured. You know, uh, there are two papers here. Can I give you the title so that you browse, download, and read them? You know, the first one is Usability. Usability, Managing Facilities for Social Outcomes. Usability, Managing Facilities for Social outcomes, okay? Some of the things I have discussed in this discussion, in this, uh, uh, this uh, talk are very well covered in that paper. And the writers, the authors are Keith Alexander. I'm sure you've heard that name several times over. He's an authority in facilities management and particularly in the area of performance evaluation. Keith Alexander, Keith is, I don't think I need to spell it, is a, a K-E-I-T-H, okay? 
Rice, Professor Keith Alexander, then Blackstad, B-L-A-K-S-T-A-D, Blackstad, is a Norwegian, Siri Blackstad, Siri is spelled S-I-R-I, and then Hansen, Hansen is spelled H-A-N-S-E-N, -E he's also from Norway, Jensen, Jensen is spelled J-E-N-S-E-N, -E he's also from Norway. Then we have Lindal. Lindal is spelled L-I-N-D-A-H-L. -L. And Lindal is from Sweden. And then we have Nenonen, N-E-N-O-N-E-N. Nenonen, who is from Finland. Interesting, isn't it, that most of these writers are from uh, uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, but the interesting thing about them is that they seem to be far more advanced, far more uh, 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 keen on the aspect of developing these tools. Uh, I want you to have that paper. I want you to read it because it reinforces much of what I have discussed with you this afternoon. And I hope you will really avail yourself of the opportunity. Remember, as we have often stressed in this class, as we have often stressed with regards to this course, the reason why you are studying uh, these things is not for academic grades, just to get a grade and get a certificate and go away. No, you are studying it so that you can uh, understand the tool, understand the concept, and use it in your organization, use it in your work. If you are a consultant, make reference to it for the sake of your, uh, of your clients. And um, the more versatile you are, the more knowledgeable you are, the better you will be able to deliver excellent services at the end of the day. So our, our purpose, although yes, we will examine you because we want to know whether we are making any sense to you, but the purpose is to help you understand and use these tools, okay? The other paper I wanted you to look at is an older paper, but it also gives to very interesting insight into the discussion we have had. The title is Usability, a matter of perspective. Usability, a matter of perspective. And it actually reports a case study, which makes it even more interesting. It reports a case study of the application of the concept in a university college in Norway. Interesting, isn't it, that most of these things are coming from Norway? But then don't forget, those who designed it in the first place, uh, part of them were from Norway. Okay, usability, a matter of perspective, and this is a case study of North Dondelag University College in Norway. Right, and um, the authors are Hansen, Remember I mentioned Hansen a little while ago. Then Knudsen, Knudsen is spelled K-N-U-D-S-E-N. Okay. Hansen and Knudsen. Okay, I would like you to, they are short papers, so they are not things that will take you ages to navigate or to read through. But they give you very good and interesting insights that can only reinforce your understanding better. Okay, so I will take that as the end of our discussion. Uh, I hope what I've had to say to you complements what Dr. Kodesho had already shared with you and that you will use both together to build your knowledge very well. Now, briefly before we close at, um, at 4.30, can we quickly look at uh, the practice of performance evaluation, that's where I will end up with you. The, the problems associated with the, with the practice of performance evaluation, okay? 
it's a pity if I look at the outline, they're supposed to have demonstration of computer programs. Now that is not possible right now be, with the way our lectures are being delivered. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but there are some local software as well as some foreign software. If there's anybody here that works with uh, AlphaMid, you will know that AlphaMid has prepared some software on building maintenance, some software on some other things. And apart from that, there are software also available online that you can watch demonstrations of to make up for that aspect. Software that teach you how to carry out a balance scorecard uh, as one of those tools we, we discussed and so on and so forth. But right now, let us just quickly look at what are the problems of the practice of performance evaluation in facilities management? What are those constraints that make the assessment of performance unduly hard? And uh, are there any means of overcoming them? Right. Among those problems, you know, are the following. First, Attitudinal problems among practitioners. Attitudinal problems among practitioners. The attitudinal problems among practitioners include uh, perception of performance evaluation as unnecessary, as time wasting, as you know, difficult and uh, distracting. They see it as distracting, they see it as expensive, they see it as time consuming. They feel that if they are getting by, if they are you know, uh, able to get on with what they're doing, that it's just okay. Uh, that's a very bad situation, but that is the reality with some practitioners. They fail to see the value of facility performance evaluation. They fail to see the benefits that it can yield because when you assess performance, the feedback you get can only help you to improve. It can also help you to avoid errors in future. It can help you to learn new ways of ensuring that your, your users and your customers are satisfied with the services rendered. It also helps you to ensure that you benchmark your productivity, benchmark your uh, capacity to improve facilities so that you are always you know, uh, improving your game, so to speak, improving your reputation, improving your competitiveness, improving your capacity to uh, draw more patronage. They fail to see all those benefits. And so they, they, they tend to avoid doing performance evaluation. The second major problem with facilities performance evaluation is opposition from management. Is it not strange that the management that ought to uh, uh, um, perceive evaluation as a strategic aspect of their firm's sustainability, I mean sustainability now in terms of continuity. Uh, is it not strange that management, the, the owners of the firm, the proprietors of the firm uh, come out uh, uh, opposing uh, performance evaluation? But that is the reality again. The, uh, the, the, the management often uh, may be at loggerheads, may be at loggerheads with the facilities management department because they are trying to minimize costs and they, they see the cost of carrying out performance evaluation as uh, a waste, which is unfortunate. Uh, there should be always in the budget an amount set aside for evaluation of performance, for benchmarking, for you know, updating records for data assets and for data uh, 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 storage. 
there should always be an R&D department, particularly in large ethnic firms that carry out the assessments because uh, that feedback can be crucial for growth and development. That feedback can be crucial for improvement in services, like I said before, but where management opposes the FM department, the onus is on the head of the FM department to try and convince management otherwise. And how do you get management on your side? It's only by demonstrating the value that FM is making to the organization, by demonstrating how much in terms of Naira value, in terms of quality of service, in terms of uh, clientele, the FM department is able to bring in I'm talking particularly to those who's, who work in FM departments uh, that are annexed or that are part of a larger organization. You know, let's say you're in an oil company and you're in the uh, FM department, or you are in a hotel conglomerate and you're in the FM department. If you don't uh, have very convincing arguments, you might find that your requirements and your recommendations and your efforts to carry out performance evaluation may be frowned at. Another reason why performance evaluation is often not encouraged in some organizations is when uh, those who are supposed to deliver the facilities, who are supposed to maintain the facilities, those who are supposed to procure the facilities don't want their errors, don't want their misdemeanors, don't want their, their failures to be exposed. And so they refuse to cooperate or they deliberately withhold information or they deliberately mislead uh, those who are trying to find out the truth about things. You will find much of that in the civil service, but not civil service alone. It happens in virtually every situation. So you, I have I mentioned now three different scenarios under which uh, problems and oppositions do arise. Yet another problem is in uh, uh, failure to think dynamically, failure to embrace new developments, failures to embrace new advances in technology and their application within facility performance evaluation. So um, the, the, the facility manager has to be on his toes to get information about new methods, new techniques, and the refinements of those techniques in order to uh, uh, be able to make use of them very well. Yet another problem lies in uh, uh, uncritical adoption of frameworks from other environments. Uncritical adoption of frameworks from other environments. What I mean by that is Nigeria, for instance, has this peculiar uh, infrastructural, political, social, and economic contexts. So when you go and pick a tool from Norway, you pick a tool from Germany, you pick a technique from US or from UK, and you want to apply it wholesale without remembering the peculiarities of the environment, you are likely not to get the uh, correct picture. You might miss out some of the peculiar problems. You might miss out some of the peculiar conditions that make things to happen the way they do. I'll take, for instance, our problem with electricity. It's a very common experience that we have electricity supply that is not stable. And that makes working lifts very, very uh, dicey, okay? The lifts, uh, you know, are dependent on energy at all times. Uh, cooling systems within buildings, unless you are making use of other means of power supply. Uh, 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 these are areas where within the Nigerian context, production or as should I say servicing of buildings 
is made more difficult than necessary. So if you are making a, a use of a tool of assessment that doesn't take account of these peculiarities, you might have a, a, a misleading result at the end of the day. Yet another problem, which uh, 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 you would be familiar with if you have been following the uh, technological advancements in the world is the inadequate infusion of uh, current advancements in technology. For instance, it is not uh, uh, hidden that we have gone to from 4G technology, we are moving on, uh, sorry, from 3G to 4G and uh, it's much faster. There are so much of other uh, platforms and methods of doing things than we were used to. And uh, under the fourth industrial revolution, 5G technology affords opportunity for faster responses, better use of data, making use of internet of things. So you can have feedback delivered to you, even electronically, without necessarily having to hold workshops with people. You can so wire your facilities with sensors and have a monitoring uh, place where you can read, you know, uh, 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 energy consumption, read uh, uh, air quality and all those things at a glance, your, your facility can give you feedback through electronic means uh, much faster than it used to be possible. You might be able to, uh, even when the people who are using the facility are not aware, you know, follow up on certain aspects of the facility's functionality. Um, a lot of those who are into FM are uh, yet to begin to fully deploy these technologies to carry out the, uh, what do I call it now, follow up of their facilities to measure how they perform on those counts. So those are some of the things that are hindering uh, the effectiveness of facilities for performance evaluation. Another one that I would have you note has to do with, uh, how do I put it now? Maybe the fact that there's no legislative backing, there's no compulsion that people should carry out a performance evaluation. Uh, if there was some kind of a, a, a requirement that made it necessary that people should report the state of their facilities you know, on a regular basis, so that uh, we can monitor and make sure that the best is available to people, people's health are better taken care of and so on. So if there was such a, 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 a framework or a, a requirement, maybe we'll have a different situation and uh, there'll be more of performance evaluation being carried out. For instance, in the area of post-occupancy evaluation, there's no law there's no regulation compelling architects and those who have built facilities to carry out that post-occupancy evaluation. There's no requirement that feedback should be submitted to a particular place so as to be able to have a proper follow-up on quality of facilities delivered. Assuming there was, maybe things would be a bit better. Maybe those who engage in building facilities will be more careful. Maybe they will take better account of user experience and things like that, okay? So all these things are some of the problems. You might have in your own understanding some other problems that you can uh, um, enumerate, maybe based on your experience in your organization, based on your knowledge of the industry. But, why are we asking these questions is because uh, being aware of these problems can help us to devise how best to organize things in the future, how best to ensure that facilities are better procured, better 
operation, I'm uh, sorry, better operated and the user experiences are improved. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for being on the class. I'm afraid I have to go now and um, I wish you good luck in your exams. Uh, if you have questions, you please. Much. Yes, if you have yes. questions, please feel free to send me uh, messages on WhatsApp. I will respond. And um, uh, any questions that I feel the whole class needs to know about, I will pass to the class governor who will then uh, share it with others. Sorry, I have okay. to go now. Thank you very much, yeah. ma'am. But please, ma'am, I have you. a question for you quickly. Concerning right. the uh -huh. seminar in a, a specialized okay. facilities. Okay, thank you very so, much. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I my mind escaped with, uh, that Madam Joy, yes. Okay, yeah. you can give us your... Yes, I remember we, we picked um, topics before the lockdown and some actually sent aspects of their work to me on email. I responded to some, but I'm not sure I responded to everybody. Uh, the idea is that um, we do our reports and then we have a seminar. The seminar was supposed to involve the whole class. So that everybody benefits from whatever each participant in 822 is able to bring up. So I will encourage all the 822 class members to conclude their work sent to me by email. Then maybe we'll have a class workshop by this same method. And each person will present their work, okay? And uh, will be assessed accordingly. Okay, but please, members of A22 class, feel free to get in touch with me, uh, either by email or by WhatsApp, if you have any issues. Okay, ma'am. Thank okay. you. We are grateful with that. Uh, but um, food, uh, from indication, the, I was told that uh, they have to put uh, the subject on the timetable, but um, since we are submitting to you personally, it does not really yeah. matter about the date or the time. So we can now fix another day for the... Yes. We can now fix another day for the uh, presentation. Yes. yes. For the presentation. Thank you. Okay. you have seen your timetable, right? When does your exam start and when does it end? Uh, exam is supposed to start by... Um, Third, 19th of we are third of 19th okay we decided no 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 sorry i i think I'm, i might be the one who is misled please give me the information you have okay 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 they said six but i believe that the, the, the dates will still be changed because we have a public holiday for 13th and 14th so i okay. don't know yet but for that uh, for what we are arranging already so they are fixing you for seventh so if it's fixed for seventh then all those who are in eight to two class must submit their reports before then no uh ma well can we submit later because exam is fast approaching our concentration now is really on the exam so many lecturers may I say are this? not actually i know i know may i say this yes. we had all of the lockdown period and after before lecture started to do our research yes Didn't we? we actually mm -hmm. we, yes but during the lockdown we all realized that there was no movement not even one person can go anywhere I after know. the lockdown after for about that, period oh. of six months so many uh, organizations are not allowing anybody to. I guess I uh, there is a bit of relief now. Okay, ma. Yes, ma. <laughs> Let me go. There's Since been some relief for months now. So, <laughs> that's what I mean. Yes, there has been. Before so, we started lectures. We to, uh -huh. Yes, we are actually trying to now conclude so that we know how to program ourselves so that we can submit. We just plead. We are pleading that you allow us to submit at least a week or two after the exam, ma. Okay, I have no objection, but there's one aspect that might be defeated. Your assessment has to be in relation to presentation to the class. So if okay, you say two weeks after, after your exam, some people may not want to participate. 
how are you going to get them to participate? We will definitely, we will all be ready to participate. If they are not ready to participate, they know they are scoring your mark. Just give them what you like. I don't want to decide. I don't want to say zero. But by the time you give them what they deserve for not participating, they know that that's a carrot and stick method. Uh, you know, the, 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 the scoring is for, is for the 822, for those who opted yes, for 822. Okay, yes, those are the Only. people who earn the scores. Yes. Those who give the scores are the lecturer to a percentage. Yes. Some other lecturers are invited to listen in. And yes. then the class. Yes. The class also gives a percentage. Yes, ma'am. Because of what they are supposed to benefit from the from the presentation. Yes, ma'am. So I will leave yes, it to you as the class governor. You must convince your classmates to attend. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's all right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Let's right. uh, release you now. I guess you have another meeting. Yes, so that I we have also to. attend to other meetings that we have. All Thank right, you then. very much, okay. I wish so you all the best. Thank, Thank you, you very much.